emotions. Little Hutton. It's a joy to be here, and it's a great joy to see you and to renew acquaintances and so many of you, some visitors that I hadn't seen in quite a while. And then to be introduced by a grandson is pretty special. By the way, what was this? I think you said racquetball in past tense. I still play racquetball in my mind. That's about the only way it can be done. Thank you to the elders for the invitation. This great series and what LaDonna and I have already been able to hear has been a blessing. I've appreciated so many of them and the depth, the preparation, uh, made notes, going to preach sermons from several of the materials that's already been presented. And I know that that's the way it kind of ripple effect, the domino effect of what can be done. The Truth and Love Lectureship has been special for many, many years. It has been a joy and a pleasure also to be associated with Case and the good work that he is doing. We have visited, we've talked, and enjoyed various emphases as far as what we're trying to accomplish. And Bray, uh, Case and Bryce working together is a, just an exciting thing as well. Wish certainly God's blessings to be upon this good church and the works that you're involved in. It's a reality like it or not. As we grow older, sickness comes. I was talking about the Larry Burnett and the stint that he had put in just a few days ago and I took a backward glance and in my own life as I sat down and I thought, okay, two hip replacements, knees bone on bone, 95% blockage in a stent, back surgery, can't see, Dr. Orton's trying to help that, can't hear, shoulder replacement, hernia surgery. I've decided I'm not going to a doctor anymore. They find things wrong with us. But how great it is if I can just give a side note commentary even as I mentioned all of those things, there's three purposes for doing that. First of all, to say that I'm thankful for being able to walk, for being able to talk and hear, and to be able to preach still. I can look around and it don't have to look very far and see those that are much less fortunate than I. I have friends and family that have helped in ways during all of these times. And all of those blessings just flow even in spite of ailments, problems, infirmities, and sicknesses. I have no doubt that many of you right now could also echo the sentiments of many of these things, and you could talk about the surgeries you've had and the, all the various ailments that you presently are enduring. But what's the purpose of our study this morning? The theme, very simply, is I'm with you always. The assurances and the encouragements and the uplifting passages that we can glean, emphasize, read again and read again and again from God's Word that help us in times of depression, in times of doubt, in times of temptation. In other words, in any situation or condition in which we find ourselves. How awesome it is that we are a part of a family, the family of God. 
How wonderful it is that we have an elder brother. We have Jehovah God, the creator of all things, and all of these things just flood within us as we count our many blessings, naming them one by one. And no matter what we face, Satan, as vicious as he is, as evil, the adversary, he's trying to defeat us, he's trying to discourage us, ultimately destroy us. He wants us to be in torment for all of our eternal time ahead. And yet I can read in this great book of God's plan, of God's desire, of what God has done even before creation week for the salvation of our souls. And that eternal home of the soul, the inheritance that's been assured and promised to us that we can have after this earthly sojourn. You see, that's all it is. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11 speaks about how that we're pilgrims and strangers here on this earth. God never intended for this to be our home. We're just here for a brief time at best, even if we live a hundred years of age. I was thinking even this morning of my siblings. There's five of us all together. And as of today, we have now, the five of us have been on this earth collectively 390 plus years. Almost 300 years of marriage, all five of us still alive and our spouses. A blessing. Some of you know Sarah. She was here for a teacher's workshop. David has been here multiple times, etc. So again, the blessings in spite of or even in lieu of that which we face on a daily basis. Maybe some of you have heard a doctor say, I'm sorry. And I've known of those that told me that tears were going down the doctor's face when he said it's cancer. And it's stage four. Many of us have not heard that. Others have. I know of two or three friends right now that is facing ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. A good preacher friend down in Georgia, he's lost his legs, his arms, his hands, can't feed himself by way of a contraption, a little machine, and they recorded his voice before he lost his voice, and he's still preaching once a month by moving his eyes on a computer screen until it gets over to A and blinking, moving it to over B and blinking, and then that turns into a sermon. I dare say we haven't faced that, have we? We haven't had a doctor say the test has come back and there's nothing that we can do. And maybe even to have them say there's no hope. Thus far, I've tried to picture in our minds in the last couple of minutes a despair, a discouraging situation, a condition that others have faced that we have not. And thus for us to maybe pause and be ever so thankful and just erupt in thanksgiving because of the blessings of God, no matter what joints have been replaced in our arms or legs or hips, or no matter what surgeries we've endured, or no matter what limitations we have. Most of us are familiar with our good friend Don Blackwell and the four-wheeler accident that took place a few years years back and he's no longer 
able to get around except by a wheelchair or a mobile device. I respect that man. He's an inspiration to me. And you know, at times we just hurt. But what has kept me going a lot lately is what I've told LaDon multiple times. Don Blackwell would love to have my legs. There's others, no doubt, that are much worse off. So count our blessings. Let's go to the Bible. By the way, I may not be able to preach today. I left my Bible down at Cedar Grove Wednesday night. I've got LaDon's Bible, so it's a feminine sermon I'm going to be preaching today from this feminine Bible. So ain't no telling what's going to come out here in just the next few minutes. I just feel like I've got one arm missing almost because I don't have my Bible. The Bible tells us about Dorcas, Acts chapter 9. She became sick and died. If I can turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says he left Trophimus sick at Miletus. We remember how Paul said, Timothy, drink something different than the water because the water's bad there. I know from that for first hand. Lazarus, a friend of Jesus, remember Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, and the one that you love, Jesus, he is sick. And he died. The one time in Scripture in John chapter 11 where it says, Jesus wept. I want to come back to that in just a moment, but let me go ahead and mention the woman with the infirmity for 18 years in Luke 13, the man with an infirmity for 38 years in John 5, the woman with the issue of blood in Mark 5 and Luke 8, the man who was a leper in Mark chapter 1, the man that was palsy, that means paralysis, similar to Don Blackwell from here down. The man that had palsy was mentioned in Mark chapter 9. Remember, he had friends that led him down through the roof to get to Jesus. The man that had the dropsy, Luke chapter 14, that means abnormal swelling. The body would just swell. The apostle Paul, as he mentioned in writing to the church at Corinth the second time, and he, the thorn in the flesh. Timothy was sick, nigh unto death, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2. The man, the men that's mentioned in Acts chapter 15, who hazard their lives to be able to work for the Savior. The man and various ones in the first century who had leprosy. Matthew chapter 8, Luke 5, Mark chapter 1. When I visited the Bible lands many years ago, They took us around to what they called what was known then as the place or the hospital for the lepers. They were shunned. They were kept away from the population because it was very contagious. And it was nothing more than basically a hole in the ground where they were doomed to stay until they died. My purpose in mentioning, referencing very very briefly, all of these things is simple. Sickness prevailed in the first century. During the time Jesus was there, and He had compassion on them many different times. We read in the Bible where He had compassion. He was moved with compassion toward those that were hurting, that were sick, or that were dying or dead, and raised them from the dead at times. I want to go back to Lazarus for a moment. Some time ago, eight or ten years ago, I was just kind of dwelling in my personal study one early one morning, three or four o'clock in the morning, best I recall, and I kept thinking, why did Jesus weep? The Lord divine, you see, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, and He was going back, and He didn't even hurry back. It took Him a couple of days to even get back after He received the message. But He got back, and one of the sisters ran to meet Him and said, Lord, if You had been here, He wouldn't have died. But Jesus knew 
He was going to raise him from the dead. And yet he wept. I'm going to say something. <laughs> I can't prove it. it. may not even be right. Well, that's an intro, isn't it? But I want to challenge your thoughts for a minute. Was it possible that Jesus wept because he did know that he was going to raise him from the dead and bring him back to this world of sin and sorrow? Jesus knew where he was at that second in time. But he wept. I'll just leave it at that. I've got several things that I want to mention, some of which are in the book and some of which are not. And so I'm, I'm fighting time already. So let me hurry. I'm going to jump kind of spasmodically from one point to the next number one. The sickness that prevails at time in this human body. If we'll just merely pause at God's creation, the human body. And we look at all that is taking place simultaneously. We take air into our lungs. We exhale the oxygen and that which is exhaled. And that which is permeating life because of the oxygen. While at the same time, blood, according to Leviticus chapter 17, life is in the blood. Blood is important and, and it's flowing through all of the veins and the arteries and the capillaries throughout our bodies. Amazing how long they are. How amazing it is that it, 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 it filtrates through the, the heart and, and goes throughout all the way down to the little bitty pinky here on my left hand. And while at that same time, the immune system, I mean, it's fighting off the disease and, and all the bacteria that's in the air or maybe that I'm touching or whatever it may be and all the other systems that are prevailing at the same time and not even to even hardly think about the brain. Only about two and a half to three pounds in size. But it actually draws about 20% of the energy that is a, 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 in order to operate. The gray matter, we call it. Isn't it amazing what God created in this human body? Is it any wonder then that Things go wrong. One of our members at Cedar Grove has lungs. Part of them have turned to what the doctor referred to. He said the best analogy or comparison I can make is that part of his lungs is like bubble gum. They're not able to process air. It's leaking air. It has collapsed one of his lungs. He knew that Smoking did that to him. You see, our bodies fail. It did in the first century. It's still now. And sickness comes to our bodies in various forms. It may be the common cold, like some of us got a bunch of crud right now and snow, sneezing and blowing our nose and whatever it is. Or, or it can be so severe. In 1980, my dad... His heart, the doctor said, literally exploded. It's like a rubber band, he said, and it just popped. He said if he had been in the hospital on a surgical table, they could have done nothing to have saved him. So from one little bitty thing to something so major as to completely take life from our being. You see, medicines help some. We've come a long way. We live in a marvelous time right now with all the things that doctors can do. My hearing's not good now, thanks to the encouragement of my family, two hearing aids now, and, and those little things on my phone and how I can control that. It's amazing what they can do in some areas such as that. 
The shoulder was replaced, total. They don't do it the old way anymore. I was fearful because I'd heard it was so terrible, but now they do what's called the reverse. They put the ball over here on the arm. They've learned. It's amazing what time we live. Sickness is inevitable. But I want to transition over to a place in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 6, a marvelous book of the Apostle Paul written while he was in prison. And he made the statement, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in the fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. But then in verse 2 he says, Bear ye one another's burden. In what seems to be a contradiction, three verses later, in verse 5, he says, every man shall bear his own burden. What are you saying, Paul? Bear your own burdens or bear one another's burdens? And all you've got to do is dig just a little bit deeper into that and flesh out the truths of what Paul is saying there. There are some things of which you and I know immediately. We've got to carry our own burdens. There's some things that you cannot help with. I've got to do. But there are other types of burdens that are maybe heavy loaded down. Our friends, our family, those near to us in worship with us, whatever it may be. And and it's things that we can kind of come alongside and tell them that I'm here. I care. Can I help? I know many of you as I'm scanning the audience and how many casseroles you have get taken to so many different people, how many times you've been to emergency rooms with different ones, how many times you've written a small note, but it meant such great things to the one that received it over and over. We're helping others bear their load. And if it's sickness, or ultimate death, or anywhere in between, that we might be able to help one another in life to help them carry their own load. Another point I want to mention before I might leave it out. We've got to realize as we kind of back up I mean, just put all of our notes and put all of our Bibles over there for a second. I've got to understand the broad scope of my purpose for being here. That this is not my final abode. This is a pilgrimage and a journey at best. And some live a long time, some live a short time. I've got to understand that it is God's plan for me to be here as a time of preparation. I am preparing now for the prepared place that Jesus spoke about in John chapter 14. I go and prepare a place for you, and where I go I'll come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, Jesus said, there you may be also. So it's really not about just longevity of life here. It's not about the pleasures and the joys and the activities of this life now on this earth. Oh, there are many. They are rich. All you've got to have is the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren or friends and brothers and sisters in Christ that love you and stand by your side and help you in every way they possibly can. And you treasure them much more than fine gold. But all of us are terminal. If we hear the words of a doctor, I'm sorry, there's nothing to do, there's no hope. It's a terminal condition. I don't know if it really happened. I heard another preacher tell the story about it, and, and to which one man who was told that, Bob Doctor said, but doctor, we're all terminal. To which the doctor said, you know, I hadn't thought about that lately, and that's true. So, 
does it not really come down to it's not so much what takes me out of this world. Dread diseases and sometimes when it's painful and things of that nature, we fear those, and I guess understandably so. But whether a heart attack like my dad who had just closed a gospel meeting on Sunday night and Monday morning had that and took his life, or like LaDon's father, who laid in a nursing home in Murray, Kentucky for five years, and the last four of those years, he didn't know who he was. But technically, does it matter? While we're not the judge and we're not ever going to try to say, okay, this man saved, that man's lost. It's not a matter about that. But at best I know, my dad had preached for almost 50 years. Ladon's dad had been an elder 40 some odd years. Both of them having served the Lord the best they can. And it didn't matter how they actually made their transition. It was terminal. This world is not our home. The focus is, is getting ready for that transition. And during the journey, to know that we're not alone, to know the words of our precious Savior, Matthew 28, 20, toward the end, after he had given the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, for lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world, verse 20 of Matthew 28. The words of the Hebrew writer, in chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, when he said, literally, I will never forsake you, I will never leave you. Or I can go back to the old law in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, the Lord thy God, <clears throat> He's a faithful God and He will always be there for you. In Psalm 89 and verse 9, He said, I... God, a strong God, a faithful God who will keep His promises. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9, and also chapter 10 and verse 13. The Lord will not let you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to. He's faithful. That's what Paul said. The psalmist also even early, early this morning, I wrote these down, pulled it out of the book of Psalms. In Psalm 41.3, the Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. He will sustain him on his sickbed. In Psalm 50, in verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and, I'll, and you shall glorify me. In Psalm 94, blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law that you may give him rest from the days of adversity. In Psalm 30, verses 1 and 2, I will extol you, O Lord. You have lifted me up, and you have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried unto you, and you healed me. In Psalm 34, <clears throat> many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The psalmist knew, didn't he? He had confidence. He wasn't waffling and saying, well, I sure hope. No, 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 no. Let's not just say, I sure hope. No matter what we face, the trauma, the trials, the adversity, the temptations, the doubt, the depression, whatever it is, let us with confidence be reminded of what Simon Peter said. He said, according as His divine power hath given us unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, through Jesus Christ, in other words, the one that has called us to glory and virtue, and whereby are given unto us, God's children, God's faithful, those that are walking in the light, 1 John 1, 7, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious Promises. In Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, who keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments. 
Do we believe that? It comes down to that really, doesn't it? I don't care if it's Ladon's Bible, my Bible, your Bible, any Bible. It tells us to believe in God. Trust God. Believe that He's going to do what He said He would do. And we can be encouraged. Even if we're laying on our bed so sick, maybe knowing that life is soon going to flow out of our bodies. But saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Stephen, the Lord himself, Luke 23 and Acts 7, the confidence of knowing who God is and what God has promised and what God will do even during times such as that. It's in the book, but I want to reiterate seven suggestions quickly. Number one, God is the God of comfort. We read that in 2 Corinthians 1. Who can comfort us, that we can comfort others. It's Him to whom I can go. Oh, I, I have family, I have friends, I know that they mean well. Job's friend maybe meant well to start with. But man sometimes let God will never let us down. Number two, we need to remember our purpose is solely to please Him and reach heaven. That's all it's about. It's all that matters. Nothing else. If we're about to die, we're not about worrying about whether or not we've been on the job enough, whether or not we've accomplished this or that or the other enough. We've got to make sure that things of the purpose of our life is done. And as we age and time passes, we need to just understand sickness is going to come. It's inevitable. Our bodies are going to fail. Can't stop it. Number four, God has promised to be with us. Number five, we need to recall and reflect what Paul, the apostle, prayed for the Philippi brethren in Philippians 1. I want you to know God. I want you to know the power of His resurrection. I want you to know and be enlightened in, in the things that are really important in life. Paul prayed that for them. And it's simultaneously applicable to us. Number five, six rather, look forward to one day going home. That's what it's all about. And number seven, be refreshed comforted and knowing according to what God has said the former things will be gone all these aches and pains and ailments and infirmities gone I love what one of the speakers yesterday said when he mentioned about I'm still here I'm here for you Heather, I'm sorry, but let me share something about when you were four years old. That was about 65, 70 years ago. Thank you, Heather. It was 40 some odd years ago when Heather was four years of age and her cousin was driving a tractor going to their grandmother's house and she wanted to go there and she jumped on to the axle and stood and held on to the fender. That was okay part. But once they arrived at grandmother's house, my mother and daddy's house, she was standing here and she still had her foot on the clutch and the motor was still running and she reached over and set Heather on the ground and the tractor lunged forward. And it ran completely over Heather at four years of age. Did not break any bones, but it did a massive amount of damage. 
the hospitals in St. Louis, where we were at that time, had us go through multiple protocols. The tractor tire went off of her little buttocks, took many layers of skin, and twice a day it was necessary for us to scrub that with betadine to make it bleed twice a day, four-year-old. We did that, and I do not know how many times I kept saying as we would try to do it, baby, I'm sorry, baby, I'm sorry, but we've got to do this. Now, I might as well go ahead and tell you, that little girl is brilliant because she learned and she made us let her do that after about three days. It was easier for her to scrub it with her little hands and make it bleed than for us to do it. The point is simple. That was necessary for the infection to be gone, for it to heal from the inside out, even though we could say, baby, I'm sorry, but it's something that we've got to go through. I'm sorry at times that we have to go through this life with all of its pain and sorrow. And tears can flow down our face when we hurt for one another. But it's something we've got to do. in order to be able to get to where we want to go. That's why Hebrews 12 is so important. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath spoken unto us by His Son. And He tells us and how we're to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith, who endured the cross and despised the shame. We're to keep our eyes on Jesus. We're not to look here and think that here is our home. But in all of the trauma, we know it's all about getting home. And we can say to one another, Baby, I'm sorry, but one day we'll get to go home. Thank you. What a great way to start the day. <laughs> Amen. Shouldn't we be grateful for the life that we have and the next breath that we are given and to know that eternal goal that we long for makes everything worth it, worth it in the end. We appreciate the lesson that we have just heard. We'll have about eight